Thanks, everybody. So I'm Daniel Westreich. I'm an epidemiologist in North Carolina, uh, where I study causality. Causality, which I'll be talking to you about today, uh, mostly in the context of uh, epidemiology, public health, and medicine. So those are where most of the examples will come from. Uh, and it's a very wordy talk, so I apologize for that in advance. So take this hypothetical situation. At 11 p.m., Jim snorts a line of cocaine. And at 11.10 p.m., Jim has a heart attack. And so our question is, did the cocaine cause Jim's heart attack? Well, what do we mean cause, right? So consider the parallel universe in which Jim does not snort a line of cocaine, but everything else remains the same. In this parallel universe, if Jim had the heart attack, then the cocaine was probably incidental. But if Jim did not have the heart attack, then we all agree that the cocaine was probably causal in this universe. So this is the essence of a counterfactual model of causality. Uh, counterfactuals are intuitive from fiction. We see them all the time. And run, Lola, run. Lola either gets stopped on the stairs or she doesn't get stopped on the stairs. And that has a huge effect on the rest of her day and the rest of her life. And we get to see both outcomes. And in sliding doors, Gwyneth either makes or misses her train. And that affects everything that comes later. So in fiction, we can watch two mutually exclusive scenarios play out. In reality, not so much. We can observe Jim snorting the cocaine. We can't observe Jim not snorting the cocaine, right? So how do we establish causality? All right, so here's another example. From 1990 to 2010, Frank smokes a pack of cigarettes every day. In 2010, Frank has a heart attack. Did the smoking cause Frank's heart attack? And here what we might want to ask is, compared to what? Compared to not smoking at all? Perhaps, but what about compared to smoking less or smoking at a higher intensity but for a shorter period of time? So we need a well-specified counterfactual to make sense of a question of cause. But even if we have a well-specified question of cause, we... Oh, sorry. Right, so <laughs> what's the effect of being a man on your risk of cancer? So this is where well-specified becomes really tricky because what is being a man? Is it possessing a Y chromosome? Is it having higher levels of testosterone? Is it society's treatment of the genders? Right, all of these things are being a man. So either way, we can't directly observe counterfactuals, but we can identify causal effects if several conditions are met. And some of the most important conditions are listed there, consistency, exchangeability, and positivity. So I'm gonna explain what these are, they're kind of big words. So the best way to think about consistency is by talking about a situation which lacks consistency. So let's say we wanna study the effect of lowering body mass index from say 30 to 25 on the risk of stroke. So the question is how exactly are we gonna lower your body mass index? Are you gonna eat less and exercise more? Are you gonna eat the same and exercise much more? Are you gonna get gastric bypass surgery? Are we gonna amputate your arms? <laughs> Right, so the effect of lowering your body mass index strongly depends on the route we take to lowering your body mass index. And ignoring that makes things difficult. Exchangeability. Older people take more aspirin out there in the world, and older people have more heart attacks. So there is, in society, an association between taking aspirin and having heart attacks. And if you're not careful, you could confuse that association with the idea that taking aspirin causes heart attacks. Of course, that's not true. It's probably just the opposite. So this is the problem of confounding, and it's what we're usually dealing with when we say something like correlation is not causation, right? So the last condition is called positivity, and in, uh, it's, which is that it's got to be possible, even if it's unlikely, for all subjects to get all possible treatments. So if only old people get aspirin, and no young people get aspirin, then we can't separate the effects of aspirin and age. We don't have positivity. So one way to assess causality then is with randomized control trials. And the reason for this is that randomized control trials give us consistency, positivity, and exchangeability, those three conditions I just went over. So consider a randomized trial of aspirin versus placebo to prevent heart attack. We get consistency in this trial by design because everyone who gets aspirin gets it the same way. They get the same dose in pill form with the same instructions, which hopefully they follow. We get uh, positivity also by design because in this trial, everyone who enters the trial has a 50% chance of getting aspirin or getting the placebo. And we get exchangeability because for every 25-year-old who gets aspirin, there's a 25-year-old who doesn't get aspirin. This is when randomization works. So that's in expectation. So, Randomized trials, terrific. They're very useful in assessing causality. But we can't randomize everything, either ethically or practically. We can't randomize people to become pregnant. We can't randomize people to be exposed to asbestos. And randomized trials themselves have problems, right? They have random error, they have dropout. So what we can do instead is observe rather than experiment. Observational data are then necessary to answer questions about exposures which can't be randomized. And there's an example there at the bottom of the, some of the kind of work that I do. So, 
in conclusion, getting to causality is always tricky, and that's especially true in observational data. But observational data are the basis of much of the published medical literature, and so I would urge skepticism rather than cynicism. Observational data can teach us a lot about cause and about the world if they're analyzed properly and interpreted correctly. Thanks. Thank you.